Yeah, hello everybody to today's webinar. My name is Eve. I'm founder and managing partner of the Python Quants. I'm happy that so many of you have signed up today on such short notice. Uh, at the beginning of the week, I thought it would be a good idea to uh, make such a uh, webinar here about uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, and a little bit obviously about hashing and encryption, which are important technological concepts when it gets to a blockchain and Bitcoin technology. Uh, before we dive into our today's um, topic, I will spend uh, a little bit of time introducing myself and the company that everybody, I guess, is aware of what we do. Um, some of you are, of course, uh, participating in our training classes, for example, or have participated maybe in one of my meetups. Um, but for all the others, I will quickly skip through what we do. Um, in the meantime, if you have questions, feel free to um, ask them. A couple of you have... Uh, uh, already um, written something in this part and there is uh, <laughs> right a question here with regard to recording yes the uh, session here is recorded and uh, we will make uh, it available uh, on the platform for those who attend our training classes and uh, I will probably make it available to uh, broader audiences as well afterwards again feel free to ask your questions via the question panel. I try my best to answer them. Sometimes it might take a while when I think there's a question I can answer later uh, or if, uh, if I don't spot it uh, immediately. But uh, again, uh, feel free um, to formulate your questions. Yeah, the Python Quants, we are a group uh, that focuses on open source for quantitative finance. Uh, although Python is in the name and Python is our focus, of course, uh, these days you cannot get by with uh, Python only or with a, with a single language in that sense. Um, so we work with other technologies as well, but when it gets to trainings and, and our core products, then it's all centered around finance. So here you see our webpage, TPQ, which is kind of a good landing page, which uh, then leads you to the other uh, websites that might be of interest to you. Um, if you want to stay informed kind of uh, more closely, so this is kind of a typical webpage that we um, only update irregularly. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is uh, dygh, but it's also kind of simple uh, and easy, straightforward to uh, find me via Google and uh, yeah, to spot me on Twitter. And there you get kind of, for example, here where you see information about our upcoming conferences, uh, also discount codes that are made available to me by other organizers or that we uh, provide to our community for our conferences. So uh, uh, I hope you follow me on Twitter and keep in touch uh, via this way. It's, I guess, the best and most current uh, channel that you can use. In addition, I'm running my private website, uh, hilpisch.com. So if you click through that, you will see many, many uh, media uh, things here um, like uh, PDFs, uh, presentations, and so forth. Also my Twitter feed and so forth. You can um, yeah, go to the website and uh, I got feedback that many people enjoy reading through the presentations because I'm covering quite a bit of Python for quant finance uh, in my talk, uh, in my talks and uh, there are collections there for a couple of years. So I don't know how many, maybe, maybe it's close to a hundred talks that you will find on the website. Um, then I want to point you quickly to an upcoming conference next week where I will participate, um, giving a talk and also a training in London. So for those in London, but others as well, because it's broadcast live, this might be of interest. The QI conference, if you're interested in attending, I can for sure provide you a, um, a discount code. So you see here, I'm doing an algo trading workshop there on the 12th and 13th um, and the conference itself is on Friday next week so uh, yeah rather short notice but uh, very interesting have a look at the webpage uh, qiconference.com uh, high level speakers uh, among others Paul Wilmot will give a keynote um, for everybody in quant finance I guess it's kind of uh, a good opportunity to catch up with the latest and greatest in, um, uh, in our industry then for those in uh, London uh, who are not yet members, might be interesting to have a look at our meetup page. Um, the group is called Python for Quant Finance. We are running regular meetups. You see I've posted today's um, 
a webinar there as well. So I reach out here. There's another conference coming up on this weekend that I've posted. But this is what we do. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say for a living because it's not <laughs> not for profit. Uh, but this is kind of the, the core here that uh, we are running larger meetups. And this is uh, thankfully sponsored by Thomson Reuters in general uh, that allow us to um, to fit more than 100 people <laughs> in the auditorium in Canary Wharf. So it's really nice. And thanks again to the sponsors here. And even if you cannot attend, uh, it might be interesting to sign up because we post uh, slides and other resources if speakers make them available. Then our conference uh, that we run since years, um, almost since the beginning, apart from the first, actually, uh, in cooperation with Fitch. It's a four Python quants conference. You see it's towards the end um, of uh, November, uh, still early bird ticket, and it's a full week of Python for quant finance. So for those in the industry um, in London or maybe just interested but not in London, they can follow online because uh, this is also broadcast live. Uh, via the web, uh, feel free to go to the web page. It's called uh, the web page URL is fpq.io, and you find all the details what's happening there in this week from Monday morning, nine o'clock until Friday night, nine o'clock uh, p.m. Actually, uh, I might be uh, rather well known for my O'Reilly book, Python for Finance. Here you see it, um, some of you might even have it. I have written also derivatives analytics with Python, which is a little bit more involved on the quant finance side. And this is my new book coming out, listed volatility and variance derivatives. So we are in the final final stages. This should appear in print um, at uh, or towards the end of the year. Uh, I don't know a date, but uh, I was um, uh, I was told that it should uh, it should be out in print towards the end of the year. I'm just in finalization of a contract to write my next book, Python for Algorithmic Trading. So uh, watch out. Uh, there will be news in this regard quite soon. Then we run, among others, the Quant platform. So if you're interested in doing financial analytics in the cloud, this might be interesting for you. Um, also, what we have written is a library dxanalytics.com, uh, which allows you to do complex derivatives analytics with Python. Um, if you are in this space, uh, it's worth having a look. If you have questions, of course, with regard to anything that I mentioned here, feel free to reach out. Uh, last but not least, and this is these days what we do uh, mainly in the sense that we focus strategically on this part of our business, is education. So we, for the first time, were able to uh, um, yeah, to build a program which leads in the end uh, towards a university certificate in Python for Finance, at least to my knowledge. This is the first and only one currently um, in the world that you can get in this field. So in, in Europe, it's even good for ECTS points, credit points um, that can be uh, used, for example, for a master um, a program. Um, we cover mainly financial data science, algo trading, computational finance there. Also, protopics uh, under which we subsume um, um, software engineering as well as um, uh, Python for Excel. So it's kind of a uh, yeah, <laughs> full-fledged package, if you like. Uh, the program that we do currently is about uh, 12 days worth of training, and you can do it completely online, live, or self-paced uh, when you follow the video recording. So that shall be it. Uh, lots of information. If you start at tpq.io, I think it's the best landing page. Uh, there you find links um, to all the other resources. And Twitter might be the best channel um, to stay in touch um, regularly. So feel free also to reach out to me if you have questions. Now let us dive into the topic of today. So I will quickly change here my window and get to the presentation. This is already hosted on our page. Maybe there are some things that I might uh, want to correct or change after uh, this webinar. So there might be an updated version, but it's already on the web page, and I will later on share the link um, that is general public as well. So hashing, encryption, blockchain, and Bitcoin mining are four topics, um, but they are closely intertwined. Um, so it's not kind of, um, they would say, well, it's four, four different sections and there are no uh, relationships, so obviously not. Uh, but it's on the other hand, just kind of um, a word of caution, is not that we will go through this and we will have kind of yeah, uh, a straightforward storyline in a certain sense. So what I will do in this webinar, I will explain a couple of uh, technology concepts and, and tools and techniques that are important in this area. Um, but we are not able, within uh, the time that we have available here, 
and to get kind of a completely a fully coherent picture of what this is all about. But I think uh, for an understanding of the most important uh, pillars of blockchain, Bitcoin mining, and so forth, I think uh, this is what my goal is. We should have an understanding afterwards what these techniques are about. And not only in understanding, but having kind of practical tools here in the form of our Python uh, libraries and the Python environment, the platform, um, that we can use to kind of um, yeah, better understand and explore these uh, now so popular and not only popular in a sense of a trend or fad, but also very important um, technologies. Before, uh, I want to start a little bit with Bitcoin data. I mean, this is where it all started out. Um, with Bitcoin, the Satoshi paper, and, and the idea of a cryptocurrency. I mean, Bitcoin is not the first cryptocurrency in the end, but the first successful one. Actually, and um, when we say, well, why is this all important? What we are talking about, I think a little bit of background, um, let's say a little bit of monetarization uh, might be useful in the sense that we will have a look at what uh, the market uh, for Bitcoin uh, looks as of these days. Um, and we will throughout, I guess, see uh, always the complete history. So how things have evolved since the inception up until uh, maybe yesterday or the day before. I don't know how current the data on Quandle is. So the total number of Bitcoins is the first thing. So um, uh, you might know that, uh, and this is already in the title, Bitcoin mining um, is kind of the process uh, by which Bitcoins, so the, the currency unit, are generated. Uh, I kind of, I mean, the, 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 the expression mining is from like kind of gold mining, silver mining, and so forth. And in that sense, uh, you can think of Bitcoin mining, and here you see, how many Bitcoins have been mined over time. And um, you see, this is almost a linear growth, um, but this is due to the fact that there is kind of a difficult para difficulty parameter built into the system, uh, which kind of uh, regulates the increase in the compute power for the calculation of hashes. But uh, independent of what, what is in the background, you see here that this is growing. And um, uh, given the design of the, of the system, there is a limit which is a little bit beyond 20 million. So here you see, um, you see it in millions. It's now close to 16 million bitcoins that we have, or the, yeah, that there are in existence that the miners have mined. This is one thing, the number of bitcoins, but it doesn't say that much. Um, the other one is how much do people do with these bitcoins? Um, and here you see that we have a different curve. Um, again, here, this is scaled um, to millions. So when we are here at the end, you see that we have something like 160 um, millions for the total number of transactions based on Bitcoin. So uh, which means that uh, indeed many, many things are happening. Many, many things means uh, businesses uh, are closed um, in a sense that the one guy sends money to the other, vice versa, and so forth. Like money in our real economy, Bitcoin is used for many, many different things, uh, not only uh, in the dark web <laughs> or deep web, uh, but also for you know, other, uh, let's say, illegal activities, of course. And uh, here see the increase, and this is uh, almost exponential in growth. Uh, the number of unique addresses, which is kind of a, a measure of... Uh, yeah, uh, entities active in the sphere. You see this has been growing rapidly as well here. Um, but this is kind of something where and um, uh, where you see that it varies strongly over time. And it's that kind of a growth uh, where you see the number accumulating. Um, addresses in existence can change in the sense that they are used, not used anymore, and so forth. Uh, you see, see the high variability here. But on average, if you would do a kind of regression through this data, uh, linear or quadratic or whatever you want to choose here, um, it's obvious that the number of addresses in existence are uh, is growing over time. What addresses are in the end will be covered in later parts of, uh, of my webinar. Bitcoin value in US dollar. This is, uh, I think, something that uh, most people talk about, especially in the financial industry, when they say, well, Bitcoin is not that relevant, you know, when we, when we have a look at the uh, transaction values in the foreign exchange markets, uh, uh, then Bitcoin is kind of negligible. But this might be true, but uh, still, if we have a look at it, um, then uh, we see that, of course, the change rate, like every other exchange rate, varies. Uh, and you can say tremendously, you see here the peak um, just before the end of 2013. 
where it has risen almost to um, 1200 and it has fallen down sharply. Now it's on the rise again. So the exchange rate is changing. Right? And, and strongly, as you can see, finance, you would say, with high volatility, actually. But again, on average, you can say, well, this is increasing. And you see it, uh, for example, if you follow some um, Twitter exchanges or uh, uh, blockchain exchanges on Twitter or whatever you see, almost on a daily basis, oh, well, it's risen again, and here you see it, it's coming down. But on average, well, we are growing. But this is not maybe the uh, um, most interesting thing here. We have a look at the market capitalization because exchange rate is one thing. Uh, but here we see the number of Bitcoins times the exchange rate. And this has a similar uh, structure, but not exactly the same. Uh, of course, we see the same spike here because of the exchange rate rises with, uh, uh, with the uh, number of Bitcoins in existence uh, not changing or changing much slower, uh, much more slowly. Then you see here that the uh, market capitalization rises as well. So we had a peak here of about 14 billion and uh, now we are about 10 billion. You see it scaled to billion US dollars. So this is kind of the number that uh, people in the financial industry typically uh, refer to when they say, well, this is kind of tiny. So it's not kind of huge um, given the foreign exchange markets that we know of, uh, like uh, the US dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound, and so forth. Indeed, what I think uh, for us today, this is not the major point to argue about the economic importance. We will be covering uh, the uh, technological features. But nevertheless, it's kind of good to know about the background and how big the market is here. Bitcoin transaction volume is another thing. So if we see here, uh, again, the uh, market capitalization, uh, the question is how much do people do like with the transactions in terms of money now? Uh, if you have a thousand transactions and they are tiny, then you say, well, the, the transaction volume is not that huge. If you have a thousand uh, transactions and every single transaction is kind of huge, then you would consider the importance uh, maybe differently. And this is uh, what we first see here. So transaction volumes in, in units, units of Bitcoin. And you see, oh, we had here a peak towards the end of uh, 2012. And apart from that, this has more or less uh, moved sidewards here. So from that point of view, we wouldn't say, well, there's kind of an exponential explosive growth here. But if we have a look at US dollar volume, we see at least that uh, over the last three, four years that we had many, many spikes here. You see it here towards the end of 2014, the beginning of 2014 again. And just recently, <clears throat> you see that the uh, Bitcoin transaction volume here measured in US dollar and in billions um, has, um, has also risen at least on average. So it has come down quite a bit now. Uh, over the last few months, but uh, we see here that um, that there is indeed some some movement in the market, and Bitcoin is used to uh, uh, turn over a considerable transaction volume. Bitcoin mining difficulty now more on the technical side of things. This is also easily read from Quandl. Um, you see that throughout here, I'm always reading from Quandl uh, data and uh, scale this data for better visualization. And here you see get in billions the difficulty. So this is not about any kind of US dollar exchange rate or whatsoever. This is just a measure, uh, a number, so to say, uh, how difficult it is to mine the next 25 Bitcoins, um, to mine a block, uh, to get the reward of 25 Bitcoins. And this has risen over time. And this is just to stabilize the, um, the mining of the Bitcoins. Um, it's getting harder and harder. So that uh, on average, this is kind of the goal, this changes obviously over time, but that on average, every 10 minutes, we see another block mined. And this is kind of the parameter that's get, that gets tweaked, so to say, in order to have this kind of steady increase. Because when you remember my very first chart, this was an almost linear growth, uh, but you would expect if there is enough money to make, then people uh, buy hardware and this is what they do. So you would uh, probably see um, exponential growth, but uh, due to here the increase in the, in the difficulty value, um, this is more or less linearized. That's the background. We will see this number in action later on once again. And when I speak about uh, hardware, um, here you see hardware and the power of the hardware in action. 
Um, the hash rate of the Bitcoin mining network is illustrated in this plot here. And the unit of measurement is giga hashes per second, which means billion hashes per second. So the calculation of a single hash value, and here in that particular case of a billion hash values per second. And you see kind of uh, here at this point, if I pick this out, this is 2 million. So the complete net, uh, the, the full network has uh, 2 million giga hashes per second capacity. So per second, the uh, network can calculate 2 billion. And this is kind of the increase in the power of the hardware that gets used. And you have to see this um, in combination here with the mining difficulty. So this is kind of increased in order to have, uh, to have this uh, 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 equalized, so to say, to have the, uh, the mining speed linearized, so to say. Um, there's a question what hashes means, and this is what the core of my webinar is about. So bear with me uh, a little bit longer, and you will know almost everything that you need to know about hashes. I mean, this is kind of a strong claim, but uh, you will need exactly what, what the hash is. So uh, afterwards, I hope that uh, you guys uh, might not be experts, but you might be well informed about the topics um, and technological concepts that are, are relevant here. You see here, you raise, you ask the question, I have the answer on my next slide, hashing. What is hashing? And hashing is at the core of the whole Bitcoin and blockchain story. And therefore, it's uh, the topic I start with here. Um, if you have a look at Wikipedia, you see the following definition. A hash function is any function that can be used to map data of arbitrary size to data of fixed size. The values returned by a hash function are called hash values, hash codes, hash sums, or simply hashes. So I myself, I'm using a couple of, um, of these alternatives. Uh, in general, hash values or a hash, simply a hash. I hardly ever speak of hash codes or hash sums, but um, this is free. You see, this is all, this all means the same thing. So input can be of arbitrary size and output is fixed size. Um, so think of something that is say, well, I have uh, a text, I have a single word, I put it into a hash function and I get my output of a fixed size, let's say 10 characters. Then I put in a sentence with 15 words and I get also my output with, say, 10 characters. And then I put in a complete a whole book with 350 pages full of words and sentences and I still get, when I put this into a hash function, an output of fixed size of 10 characters in my example. So this is in principle what a hash function is. Uh, it's a rather abstract concept. Of course, this need, needs to be kind of specialized and formalized, implemented, but it's, this is at the core, the, this very idea. And to start with, to give you a good basic understanding, because the hash functions used in practice, they are not that easy to represent, to show, to illustrate, and to explain, I start with a very simple hash function, which for Bitcoin mining and, and encryption, and what we are talking about here today, is uh, in principle useless, uh, but the use is kind of a better understanding of the concept. So for my first simplistic hash function here, I consider uh, one that maps any string to a three-digit integer. So whatever I throw at my function, this shall return a three-digit integer. And it uses ordinal numbers of one character string objects. So here in Python, you see when I, when I type ORD and then put in A, I get the number 97, the ordinal number of the letter, the lowercase letter A. The opposite operation is uh, uh, called CHR for character, and the character of the number 97 is A. So I have this kind of um, um, function or the two functions um, which uh, transform the output um, to each other. So this is kind of the basic here that I use. So later on, the functions will work completely differently, but this is just uh, to illustrate the concept. So my function now does the following. Um, it's really simplistic uh, in the sense that we take the average integer ordinal number here, and you see, the value here is calculated at the sum of, and here we have a list comprehension uh, in, the, in the parentheses, 
the ordinal number of L for every L in text. So L is now a letter. And the text, this might be now a word, this might be a sentence, <clears throat> and so forth. And uh, lastly, I take um, the average value. This might be a small number, like one or two, but I return it always as a three-digit number. So this is what I do in order to conform with the definition that says output of fixed length. This is what this simple function does. So we can immediately use it. This is, a, you remember, a hash function with three lines of code only. So in the hash function, I put in an exclamation mark. Um, the hash value, the hash that I get, is 033. When I put in my first name, I get back 113. So you see, I can throw at it whatever I like, and I get back a three-digit number. So this is, uh, so far, it satisfies the definition of a hash function. I throw at it whatever I like, and I get back a three-digit number by some magic. We know it's not magic after all. It's just a simple function that we have implemented ourselves. Even if there's something larger uh, containing more numbers and, and still, you can try it, uh, put something uh, large at it, and you will get back here the three digits. <coughs> Quant 4711 will be one of my examples that I use later on. But now we have one problem with this particular hash function. Because the target space is rather tiny, so we only have three digits, we find collisions easily um, due to the target space and due to the construction. That we that we have chosen. So here you see hash function of Eve is one one three. We know that, but what we see is that Eve in reverse order, Sefi, so to say, is also one one three. So we have a collision. Collision in the sense that two different inputs lead to the same output. You might say, well, for my purposes, this is not a problem. Yeah, sure. In many, many cases, this might indeed not be a problem. Um, but for what we are after later on, um, this is a problem. And we will require from a good hash function that um, it is almost collision proof. So there will be collisions due to the very construction and due to the very concept. But um, it should be highly unlikely that we find a collision like the one here. So for me, it was quite easy because I know how, it, how it's constructed based on a mean value, and I can easily get here to a collision. Our target space has 10 bits only, um, which means here the binary representation of 999. So we go from 000 to 999. This is what we have here. Um, you see here this is the binary representation. And with uh, 10 bits, we can represent only uh, yeah, 1024 um, combinations here. And uh, if we have a look at modern hash functions, they have a target space of uh, 2 to the power of 128 minus 1 possible values. You see here, so 2 to the power of 8, this is kind of a large number already. <laughs> and you see here the hex representation. So it's a little bit nicer because we have many, many zeros here. And the length of um, our hex string here is uh, 31. So this is uh, the uh, what we can uh, what we can represent. The uh, 256 bit target space, which is kind of a regular thing, also for um, for the the SHA hash algorithm that we will encounter later on. Uh, which is the basis for Bitcoin, you see how huge the target space is. So we had, again, remember, a target space of 1,000. So 1,000 is something here. Uh, these three digits is 1,999. You see this huge number here represented as a hex. And you see our hex string has 63, 64 um, um, characters. So this is how we, how we can... Uh, work with it and you see already when I have 256 bits as the target space available then a collision as constructed before where we had 113 and we found another input value which yielded 113 
gets more unlikely the larger the target space here is. But um, it's still not enough. So the size of the target space is not enough uh, because if you have an algorithm which is similar to the one I've used, like an averaging procedure or what they say, well, no matter what the sequence of the characters is, I can end up with uh, the same values easily, um, then this wouldn't um, fulfill the requirement of collision. Um, uh, of co yeah, the being free of collisions uh, and either because uh, then by the very algorithm um, uh, we can easily tap in the, in the collision trap. Uh, but this is one prerequisite, so to say, to avoid collisions. And if you go one step further, um, and I don't want to get farther than this, and uh, you might notice or see that some hash functions have a target space of 384 bits, I see that this is indeed quite a huge number. Um, and it's kind of nice in Python to see these huge numbers in other languages. You would have uh, problems to represent such a number uh, at all. But here in Python, we don't have this, uh, this particular issue. So this is a huge number, and the target space is indeed large. So this will be um, one of the features of the hash functions that we're going to use, that the target space is large enough and not kind of three digits like the one we had used. If you compare the target space I've just described to um, the number of atoms in the universe, you get maybe a better feeling for the size of the target space. So um, if you Google this up, you find different sources, but uh, what they say, so to say on average, is that um, uh, physicists estimate that the number of atoms in the universe uh, shall be around 10 to the power of 80. So this is already a huge number. You see it here written out. And uh, when I write this as a hexadecimal number here and uh, count the number of um, um, characters that I need to represent, you see that I'm at 66. Here, when I go back, um, I was already beyond that. And with uh, the 256 bit, I'm pretty close. So the target space of my 256 bit, this is uh, the lesson learned here, is close to the number of atoms estimated um, as of today in the universe. So uh, you can see if you have a function which does a proper job and which maps any kind of input to uh, a one of the atoms in the universe, then uh, it shall be highly unlikely that you map uh, the input to another atom. But again, this is um, a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one, if you like, for the algorithm, uh, if you want to speak in mathematical terms. In summary, we require the following uh, properties. Um, I have focused on collision, collision resistance, that we can be um, almost sure, that, so to say, that we won't find collisions. Um, that it's highly unlikely to find inputs um, that yield the same output. Hiding is another one that we require. It is really difficult to find the exact input if you know an output. So it shall be easy enough to get from the input to the output, but it shall be difficult to get from the output to the input. So one direction shall be easy, the other one shall be uh, hard or... Yeah, eh. In an ideal world, impossible, but uh, we are not living in an ideal world. Puzzle friendliness is kind of a characteristic uh, that you find these days in, um, uh, in Bitcoin books and other descriptions, um, which says that if someone targets a certain output value and if parts of the input are randomly chosen, then it shall be difficult to find another input value that hits exactly that target. Um, so it's kind of, uh, in the end, we will see that. Um, it means, among others, that you won't see any kind of convergence, so to say. Uh, usually with mathematical algorithms, um, think of something simple like newton refson for example, where you numerically um, solve equations looking for the roots, where you say, well, the more iterations I do, the closer I get to my uh, desired value. This shouldn't be the case here in the sense that if I'm looking for some target value, um, I shouldn't get any kind of hint whether I'm close or getting closer to it by my efforts or not. So it's not that somebody is sitting there and saying, yeah, now you're getting better, now you're getting closer, now you're uh, uh, getting further away, and so forth. So this is what is meant here by puzzle friendliness, and we'll see it um, and uh, I think understand it in the context of Bitcoin mining uh, a little bit. 
better. Now let me get to a real hash function. And if you speak to security and encryption experts, they would say, well, why can you use MD5? This is not kind of uh, secure anymore. I don't say anything about um, the security and the robustness of the technologies. I'm just using it here. And MD5 is still, as of these days, used in practice. Um, but again, I, I, I wouldn't recommend to use it uh, after all, for example, to store um, um, passwords or whatsoever. Um, but I have based my example here on MD5 hash codes. Uh, later on, we will work with uh, SHA-256 uh, ones, which are the basis for Bitcoin. But let us import the respective Python library. It's called Hashlib. And as the name suggests, it allows us to calculate, among others, hashes. So here, the first, let's say, couple of hash codes. Um, I'm using my name and variations of it. Here you see it, to calculate MD5 hashes and to represent them here as uh, hexadecimal numbers. So here hex digest gives me the hashed value as a hexadecimal number. There are other ways of representing it, but this is, I guess, the, the most human readable uh, form that we have. And you see, whatever I throw at this function, Eve, Eve2, or my complete name, Dr. Eve Johannes Silpisch, I get back something of fixed size. And it is not random. At first, you could think that, well, this looks really random. So I, I, I um, put in a string and I get back something random. And this is not the case. I will show you later on a function which, which gives back some random string which looks in the same fashion. But here, a hash function is in that sense deterministic in that I can repeat this operation as many times and others can repeat it and everybody, if the implementation of the algorithm is correct, will come up with the same solution. So it's not random, it's deterministic. This is an important aspect here to understand because when you look at these um, strings here, hex strings, uh, oh, it's, it's a random collection of numbers and, and uh, letters here. So, well, uh, might be some pseudo-random number generator behind it. No, not at all. It's a deterministic algorithm. And again, the point, no matter how long, how large the, um, uh, the string is, the output is here fixed in size. Let us try to, uh, to crack a password because uh, hashes are used, among others, to store passwords. Uh, passwords, and I mean, this is a very current topic. If you if you think of the scandal around Yahoo, and I'm not talking about the spying, but what has become recently uh, known that hundreds of millions of uh, account uh, data sets have been um, stolen from Yahoo. Um, what they have stolen is kind of the username, it's maybe first name, last name, and all this kind of general information. And in general, what, what is in such a record is the password, and the password stored as a hash code. So the basic idea is that if you store a password as a hash code, then even the administrator that has access to such a record cannot know what your password is. Because as we know, it's rather simple to see what the hash is for a certain password. But the other way around, if you have the hash and want to recover the password, this is what is really difficult. So what, what the, the requirement or the characteristic that was called hiding in that sense. And um, password cracking in that sense is kind of uh, reversing the, uh, the hash procedure. So indeed getting then from the hash uh, to the input. And uh, we would start out easy here. I start out easy in a sense that we restrict ourselves to lowercase letters only. So uh, the alphabet, lowercase alphabet, is what I'm using here. Um, and you see, when I iterate over the uh, single characters, A, B, C, D, E, you see the hash values, the MD5 hash values. So in, a very, in the most simple case in the world, if you like, if, if I knew that the password would consist of one lowercase letter only, then I just have to look up here 26 different values and compare these. So if this is all that I need to check, then I have to check just... 26 hash values, and if I found the correct value, say this one, I know the password has been G. Fortunately, 
it's not that easy in practice. So in practice, people are using multiple characters. They use digits, um, uppercase letters, special characters, and so forth. But this is the most simple case where you can wire brute force, where such a table can look up the password to stay in this world uh, when you know the hash. But let us get a little bit more realistic, and I'm using here now my uh, first um, password. Um, the first password, which was um, which was Eve. So we have four lowercase characters, um, and I'm doing a brute force here in that I start with one characters, move to two characters, to three characters, then to four characters, and I try out, and this is what IT product does here, I'm using ITER tools, and I'm trying out simply all combinations possible. So this is really brute force. No intelligence after all, it's just brute forcing through all the combinations for the allowed character set. And you see here, we get the message one character used nothing happens two characters nothing three characters nothing then it starts using four characters and finally we have the success you see here via this procedure we have found the correct password which means Eve my name given the hash value so this is brute force password cracking and you see if you have a four letter password only then even just using Python oh well this is rather quick so it took half a second only on my machine with Python and Python is all but really fast in this uh, discipline if we now increase the character set to include digits as well so we have ABC until set lowercase and 0 to 9 then we can attack the second password. The second password was um, Eve2. Do you remember that from before? Eve2 here. And you see for the first four iterations, up to four characters, no success. Then it starts with the fifth one and it finds it sometime later uh, here, the, the hash, and it finds the respective password. But you see, just by adding one character and by uh, adding digits, the time to crack this password has increased from half a second to 50 seconds. So it's uh, roughly a factor of 100 um, uh, the, uh, power or yeah, compute effort that we need to put in here to come up with um, the respective password. So that's already more secure, but still one minute and yeah, slow infrastructure, Python, and here my notebook. Um, still, this is all but safe. Um, and uh, when we see how fast my machine was, so we have crunch to uh, recover the password here, th uh, 43 million hashes. Um, and this translates, oh, it was when I did it uh, previously, it was a little bit faster, so obviously this depends on what is going on on the machine. But that's beyond 800,000 hashes per second. So this is the speed <clears throat> that I can get here with Python on my machine. Um, you would say, well, this is not too bad. Uh, I mean, uh, it's better than typing in something. <laughs> Try it out on your own. Uh, I let it run, and uh, you see after, after a minute, I'm, I'm close to 50 million. Um, so this is not uh, this is not too bad, but it can get much much faster than that. So this is, if you like, uh, the lower end of um, the password cracking machinery um, that you can use. Um, you can do better. The first, what you can do better is you can use better software. Better software means that, for example, you can use Hashcat. I think Hashcat is one of is probably the most popular password cracking tool. I like to play around with it uh, myself and to see how uh, safe different things are. Um, and yeah, it's kind of uh, fascinating if you have some interest in that. And uh, here I'm now using Hashcat um, to do the same exercise, which means to recover my Eve2 password stored as an MD5 hash. 
The password length is obviously five letters and I restrict the character space to lowercase letters and digits. So I make use of what I know. So usually when you say, well, it's five letters, then you must really consider whether there are kind of uh, uppercase letters in there, special characters and so forth. So these are all considerations um, that we don't want to do. Here's just for illustration and um, uh, yeah, making use of what we know already. And uh, you see here the output, I've stored this as Python code because I had a little trouble of um, storing it otherwise. So as a Python string, you see here with Hashcat the output, so it was successful. So for the hash code, it uh, got me back uh, Eve 2. And here you see my mask attack where I say, well, I'm using lowercase and digits. So this is kind of the, the way it works, how you define masks here. The hash type was defined before. And you see that um, here on my MacBook, um, without using GPU or whatsoever, it uh, gets to a speed uh, with this approach here for this particular case of uh, 13 million, so 13,000 kilo hashes, 13 million um, hashes per second. So this is already a little bit faster than our 800,000 hashes. So software itself, um, um, yeah, uh, speeds it up. Uh, and you see here, um, real user and system. So parallelization is used here as well. Um, and this boils down then to less than two seconds um, time here that is used. So much, much faster than my 52 seconds or whatsoever. The next point is when you do password cracking, and this is also uh, for you to reconsider maybe your passwords, I don't know, maybe this might be a hint is that um, mask attacks are a real powerful tool of password crackers, uh, which means that uh, human beings use certain structures for their passwords. So for example, the last four digits are, uh, or characters are usually, or quite often digits, and uh, in particular, they are years in general. Um, so here is an uh, interesting analysis um, that I provide here. I think I have it open. Here, statistics will crack your password. They analyze kind of the masks used. And you see here that it's worth a read, actually, that 13 different masks, think of it like kind of password structure, so to say, are already responsible for 50% of all passwords. And then... The other 260,000 different structures that have been identified account for the other 50%. So uh, just 13 different password structures um, are enough to recover 50% of the passwords. So what does this mean? Um, here I have it written down, uh, the lessons learned. 50% of all passwords analyzed rely on 13 password masks only out of 260,000 masks. So an example here is, for example, uh, uh, Lisa 2008, which is something like the name of the daughter born in 2008. So this is uh, a, a typical mask. So four, uh, four characters, uh, lowercase letters, and four uh, characters, digits. Then if you say, well, but I assume that there is an uppercase letter in such a password, then the probability is, I think, um, about 90% or something, I don't have the number uh, readily available, um, but it's usually then the first one. Like in German, we, we have um, uppercase characters for every noun, and every sentence starts with uppercase letter. So it's, it's not that you are used to write words with an uppercase letter in the middle. So writing L-I uppercase S-A is really unnatural for us human beings. Whereas writing uppercase L, I-S-A, is natural and this is kind of here making use of human traits and this is what I do here in my next example using hashcat where I do a mask attack where I say um, the password length is nine letters which is already quite a bit a nine letter passwords I mean is uh, I guess beyond the average I don't know the average number but this might be already the average or beyond the average <clears throat> The first letter is assumed to be uppercase. This is what I commented on. The next four letters are lowercase, or to be assumed lowercase, and the last four ones are like 
a, uh, a year, like year 1992. And then we have a structure like A, B, 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 1992. And I can represent in Hashcat this easily. Um, easily here, you see the mask. This is kind of my mask representing what I've pointed out. So here is uppercase, lowercase, 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 digit, 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 digit. This is my representation of the mask. And you see here why by this approach, I can get to a speed on my machine, again, without using um, without using GPU or any other kind. There is parallelization uh, involved uh, on the CPU side, but not on the GPU. Um, and you see I can get here to a speed with this approach to 42 million hashes um, per second. So getting faster and faster and making use of um, human traits, as I've called it. Um, and you see we are walking through a rather large space and uh, recover here the password quant4711. 40 million, this is the next number you should remember. So then, of course, we can throw better hardware at the problem. Um, now we are moving towards Bitcoin mining. Uh, the first is using GPUs. Um, this is a picture I have taken. I just recently ordered that to put it into a machine for my for my uh, son to play. This is the, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, the cheapest and and uh, most entry level GPU graphics card from NVIDIA. It's called uh, uh, the GeForce GT 710. It cost me roughly 30 euro net of VAT. So it's uh, including VAT. It's something like 37, 36, 37. Um, and it reaches, I've tested it in my own, um, it reaches on the machine where it is uh, built in now a speed of 400 mega hashes per second. So this is already kind of a significant speed up. So we can do 400 million hashes per second with this 30 euro uh, gimmick, if you like. Um, and you would expect if you invest maybe 300 for more current NVIDIA one, uh, which is used by, by, by current gamers or younger gamers, uh, performance gamers, then uh, this increases. You can go really far, and this is the fastest that I have found, and uh, obviously it represents a record benchmark for Hashcat. This is a hardware, um, yeah, piece of hardware, <laughs> an 8 GPU monster, as they call it, and Brutalis, Brutal, I mean, uh, it's kind of a, a speaking name for that, uh, which has built in uh, eight recent uh, GPUs from NVIDIA. The GTX uh, 1080 are built in, and this reaches a hashing speed of 200 gigahertz per second. 200 um, billion hashes per second. So one trillion hashes in five seconds. And you see here, this costs quite a bit. Uh, basic configuration here, 18,499. It's 500 times faster than my cheap NVIDIA GPU. And if you multiply the price by 500, you somehow end up here on <laughs> this level. So it, um, uh, performance per price, per euro, or per US dollar, depending on what you want to base it on, is similar. But this is kind of what, what people can get to. And uh, as far as I've read, I've provided here um, the link. Um, they write that for the first time, it's a system that breaks uh, 200 gigahertz uh, gigahashes on MD5. So it seems to be the first um, uh, hardware compilation that is able to go beyond 200 gigahashes um, in this regard. But if we speak of mining, and we then come to mining uh, later in this regard, um, even such <clears throat> a machine cannot compete um, because they are specialized machines, specialized machines in the sense that they have built in application specific integrated circuits called ASICs for short. These are chips. This is a piece of hardware that is specifically built to um, yeah, be the best, to be optimized for certain algorithms. Usually what you have is general purpose CPU, central processing units that are built to be good at almost anything you throw at them. Uh, with ASICs, it's the other way around, that you build the hardware around a, an algorithm. And here you see one which is really cheap. So here you see this is, I found it only used at Amazon here. The Bitminer, here is the picture. 
on the German Amazon, you see this is uh, used for something like 220. Uh, you can buy such a machine for Bitcoin mining. And um, what this allows you to do is to calculate 1,155 giga hashes per second. Not MD5, what we reported before, but here SHA-256, of course, uh, because the Bitcoin protocol is based on this uh, particular um, this particular um, hash algorithm. So you see for much less money, you get higher performance for specific use cases. And therefore, even if you would be willing to invest that much money, uh, you wouldn't be competitive in the Bitcoin mining space because this is general purpose hardware and this is dedicated hardware, which is for the specific purpose it is designed much, much faster. So don't try to do it anymore with uh, CPUs or GPUs um, or even FPGAs that have been used for quite a while. Now the basics of RSA encryption, because this is also important for the, um, the whole mining, uh, mining and signing, that's a rhyme actually. Um, because public keys and private keys which are kind of at the core of encryption here, RSA encryption, are also heavily used, um, for example, for Bitcoin addresses and in the whole sphere. Therefore, I'm covering here the basics. Again, I start with the, um, uh, the res uh, respective packet passage from the Wikipedia page here. Um, and RSA is here called one of the first practical public key crypto systems and it's widely used. And indeed, it's widely used uh, for many, many things um, to think of SSL encryption and so forth. In a crypto uh, system, the encryption key is public and differs from the decryption key, which is kept secret. So in RSA, we have uh, what is called asymmetry. And the asymmetry, or, or after all, the potential for this asymmetry is based on the practical difficulty of factoring the product of two large prime numbers, the factoring problem. So this is all based, if you like, on number theory, um, elliptic curves, as we will see. Uh, in a few minutes and uh, yeah but the two major terms here are public and private key but what are public and private keys I have a simple example which I found really useful um, and uh, this is also found in a respective Wikipedia article so we start here for this example with very small prime numbers 53 and uh, 61 P and Q so this is now not practice, this is just example. This is a little demo, if you like. Uh, but I think it illustrates quite well how the whole procedure works. So we have two small prime numbers, 61, 53, P and Q. When we compute the product of these two, it's 3, 2, 3, 3. Now when you think of two huge numbers here, then we would get an even huger number. Uh, even larger number and it would be really difficult to get from, uh, uh, from uh, to find P and Q if you have such a large number but here of course we are working with very small number just for illustration purposes 3233 three, three is our end this is the product then we calculate something that is called the totient of the product where we see use uh, here we subtract minus one from both of our values, and we end up with another number called T here, 3120. So we have P, Q, N, and T, already four numbers. Now we choose any number which is smaller than T. We call this E, and the only requirement that we have is that it's co-prime. Co-prime means that the um, greatest common divisor is one. So there's only one that divides the two numbers we are talking about without rest. And this is in our case here, uh, for example, E. E equals 17. So we can find many others here, but uh, 17 is chosen here for illustration purposes. 17 and T share one characteristic. They are both divided by one without rest and not by another number which is greater than one without rest. This is what co-prime is about. Now there comes uh, a little bit of a harder um, multiplication, um, yeah, a modular, uh, modular inverse uh, multiplication here. Uh, it's called the modular multiplicative inverse. 
And to see the um, written down, it's easily D times E modular T shall equal one. So the procedure to come up with a number is not that straightforward. Typically, you don't write it down and with pencil paper and you come up with it after three seconds. But here I'm providing this number and it is 2753. Um, it's like with the other operation. It's easily verified whether D indeed satisfies that. So here you see 17 is uh, uh, E. And if we chose D2753, Modulo t, t is here, 3, 1, 2, 0, shall be 1. This is easily verified. So d times e modulo t gives 1. But again, the procedure to come up with the number is not as straightforward. So it's not like kind of multiplication and division. It's, it's a little bit more involved. But for the, for the time being, let us live with this number d. So we have already compiled a few of them, but now we are ready to do the encryption. The public key N we have already available since uh, a couple of slides ago is N equals 3233. Three, three. Our number E is 17. You remember this is the, the co-prime one to the totian. The encryption function for a certain M, a number M in my example, is C for cipher of M equals M to the power of 17. This is our E here, modulo N. So this is the encryption function. M, I define this here as um, um, my message, a number, because we can do the calculation much easier. Otherwise, we would need to do transformations and so forth if we have text. So here with numbers, it's straightforward. 77 is one of my favorite numbers. And you see M77, and I do M to the power of E modulo N is the encryption. And the encrypted value of my message is 3123. This is the encrypted value. And the basic idea is, here what you see is that this is rather easy when I know the numbers here. Uh, they are defined for me for me as the one who encrypts the message. This is uh, straightforward, easy to calculate. But for someone else, it should be really, really hard. This is what encryption is about, to get from that number to the original one, to our message that we want to send. This can be, I don't know, this can be a code for a safe, <laughs> let's say, um, which is of value to an attacker. And it should be hard to, to get from, like with the hash function, to get from that value to that one. But if I have the private key here, d equals 2753, then decryption shall be straightforward. So if someone sends me the encrypted message and I have the private key, 2753, then I can do the decryption. M of C equals C to the power, you see this is now a huge number, 2753 modulo 3233. Three. And again, here doing the math, we easily come up with the message. M for the message, C for the cipher of the message. So this is basically what public and private key encryption is about. So without this key, it's hard to come up with, uh, with the solution. Of course, again, don't think in practical terms now. This is for illustration purposes. Keys in practice look different than these four digit numbers. But this is the basic, uh, these are the basics about uh, RSA encryption. Now we can apply our knowledge um, with real RSA key pairs, as I have called them. To this end, I use a, um, a cryptographic library, PyCryptodome. Um, you can install it by pip install. PyCryptodome X is what I would recommend. There are two versions, the so one without X and the one with X. I would recommend installing the one with X. Then you can do from cryptodome.publickey import RSA. And 
here you see that I generate a key. Key equals RSA generate and the number of bits. So as simple as that. Now I can export, I don't know whether I use the, the secret code here or just a randomly generated one. This might be a superfluous here actually. Um, let me make a quick note for myself. Secret code, okay. Um, when we have such a key, you see here, key is my uh, key. I can export the public key part here and print it out. And yeah, uh, if you have used um, these such key pairs for SSA access, uh, accessing or what, you, you know how they look like. Begin RSA public key, and then you see a collection of characters, special characters like dash, um, uh, numbers, digits, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, and so forth. And here, the message and RSA public key. You see, this is quite a lengthy key compared to our four-digit key that we have been working with before. So this is the public key. The private key is even longer. So here you see uh, the private key, again, with the uh, uh, begin and end messages. Um, and I think, again, impressively, illustrated that keys used in practice are much, much larger uh, and therewith more secure than uh, the small ones that we have used in the introductory example. So how can we work with it? Uh, of course, we want to use it for encryption. We want to send the message and we want to encrypt it. So uh, first, we assume that uh, someone sends a message to the Python ones, so a company who own the private key. So first, what I do here is from Cryptodome Cypher, I import the respective um, encryption function. I here generate the message. I say hello to the Python ones times five. So I simply make it larger. Um, so my string, my resulting string will have uh, five times the content that you see here. And here I'm generating a new key. Oh, this oh, a new cipher. Sorry, I'm not generating a new key. Um, I'm generating um, a new cipher, new encrypted uh, message to which I add my text here. So the cipher itself is based on my public key that I have generated before. So here, uh, the key generation has taken place here. So key equal, this is the key generation. To have it clear once again, this is the public key, this is the private key that I've shown you. And here I start ciphering, which means encrypting the message using the previously generated key. And for the encryption, I use the public key. Here I do the encryption. M is my message, so like before. And what I called before in my example C is now ciphertext. And you see here the uh, C struct representation of my encoded message. So it shall be hard for somebody else which does not own the private key to get from this text to the original one, which is five times the sentence that you read here. The decryption now uses the, um, the private key. Again, this is all what I generated before. Um, and the message is now gotten via the opposite operation. Decrypt, I put in ciphertext. Ciphertext was that one here. <laughs> this cryptic text, we can say. This cryptic text, this ciphertext is here decrypted by the use of our private key. And the message now appears unencrypted decrypted. Hello to the Python ones five times. And this shall be considered, um, let's say, almost secure or secure for practical purposes. Or what they often say, it's bank standard security. And what they mean is kind of, if even banks that kind of transfer billions of dollars, um, sometimes per day, use it, then it shall be safe enough for everybody else. So this is the basic um, working of RSA encryption based on public and private keys. 
for practical purposes um, on Linux and, and Mac systems, I don't know whether there is a port to Windows, um, you would usually use OpenSSL. I just provided the code um, and I decided to include this uh, single slide here uh, because, for example, this is exactly the code that is uh, used that I use to generate a public key pair when I want to set up a, a secure Jupyter Notebook server in the cloud, which is based on such uh, a public private key um, encryption mechanism using SSL encryption. Uh, and this is actually the line of uh, code, of bash code right here that I use to generate the, um, the certificate, so to say. Um, so you see, this is all really, really practical and it's used. And, and you are probably using it even if you don't think about it or are not aware at this particular moment, what you're doing there, use exactly the same methodologies and technical approaches that we cover here at this moment. Now let us combine two things, signing messages with hashes and RSA keys. So we have again the same message, hello from the Python quants, five times. So this is now from the Python quants. Remember, before it was to the Python quants, we received something and we decrypted it. Now we send something out. And what we do is we want to make sure that this message uh, gets to the receiver of the message um, in a way that he knows that indeed we have sent this. Just think of somebody calling his broker and says, well, I want to buy a thousand Apple chips. Um, and what is of importance is that the broker doesn't book 500 Microsoft chairs. Um, so there must be some mechanism to say, well, I sent the message and my message was about a thousand Apple shares and buying these Apple shares. <laughs> and uh, in such a use case, such a scenario, we are now here that we send the message and you see, the first thing that we do to make sure that the message is transmitted correctly is that we hash the message. So we have a hash value for our complete message. And we know it's easy to calculate that, but it's hard to get from the hash to the original message. But this is just now kind of a signature of our message, like a checksum. We can use this as a checksum, saying, well, this is indeed the content of my message. Sender and receiver can say, well, oh, I received the correct one because I checked via the hash that I received the correct message. But the next thing is that we sign the message. Um, how can the receiver know that indeed I was calling, I was sending this message? Maybe somebody else said, well, this was Eve on the phone um, and Eve uh, asked you to uh, buy a thousand Apple stocks, but Eve doesn't want to buy a thousand Apple stocks. So, there need to be some signing procedures, some identification. And this is here accomplished by the use of, um, of uh, uh, using keys, uh, public and private keys. Um, we encrypt the hash code with the private key from before. What we have used before is now used here to see for a signing procedure where we sign the hash code. So the hash code H here is signed by us with our private key. And the assumption is, of course, since it's a private key, that nobody else has our private key. On the other end, the, um, um, the receiver, in my case, the broker, uh, can easily check the hash code or calculate the hash code of the message. And what he can also do is that he can check whether I have signed it or not. Because if he owns the public key, he can then check whether I indeed signed it. Because if I'm the only one who has the private key, then with his public key or my public key in his uh, possession, he can easily check whether I have signed the transaction in my example or the message in general. So here, Hashes and um, encryption in the form of public and private keys, asymmetric um, encryption, uh, can be combined to sign messages. This is also done, for example, uh, in many different contexts. Uh, this is um, done, for example, or can be done um, when you use uh, Git and you do a commit in Git, you can uh, sign your commits and say, well, that's indeed me who committed something to the repository. Um, in Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general, you sign transactions. So this is used 
quite, quite often. Let us move to the basic idea with our background knowledge now to blockchains. What are blockchains about? I mean, um, it's a hype word, but I will start out really simple. And um, I know the deficiencies that are built in what I present, but again, it's a very simple example. And uh, I like to start with very simple examples. And uh, for what we're going to do, I and you remember, we require collision resistance, hiding puzzle friendliness from our hash code um, and for blockchains in similar fashion. So we will focus here on collision resistance and hiding for the moment. As a starter, um, it's obviously easy to calculate the hash value of a string, a first block, our starting block, for instance, as follows. I import hashlib. And I will build a blockchain with our three dogs. Unfortunately, my beloved dog Jill uh, died recently, but I start with our first family dog, Jill, here, uh, which uh, was born in 2004, and we got her in 2004. So this is our first dog, and this is the first block, if you like. I can now calculate a MD5 hash for the first block. So here is the hash code. This is now not about not recovering what is here. So uh, we see all the information. So it's not kind of hiding something. So it's just kind of the first hash for the first block. Nevertheless, it's highly unlikely that another input yields the same output. So it's really difficult to find the input given a certain output. So. Um, this is for fact, and we know this uh, since we have discussed hashes previously. Now let us add a second block, so to say. A block chain consists of multiple blocks chained um, together. Um, and typically with regard to cryptocurrencies, you think of transactions in this regard, but here I'm talking about new docs. So in 2009, we got our second doc, Liz. She is still happily alive and it's a wonderful dog. Um, and you see to my first hash code, I add now the text LIS2009. And I um, calculate the hash code for my new block, which consists of the previous hash plus name and the year where we got LIS, when LIS was born. So we get the second hash value here. So I think this is all straightforward with the background knowledge. And we move on to our third dog, Phineas, which is uh, a male, uh, the only one but recently. And the same procedure. We have the hash code H2, we add the new text, and we calculate the new hash code. So we have a block chain, a chain of blocks. B3 here is uh, what is called a block. So the block chain now is as follows. B1. Then we have B2, which is the hash value from the first or second dog. B3 is the hash value from the second and the third dog, and so forth. We can now add to this uh, in infinite manner. And you see the hashes here are always kind of same length. Uh, we know the characteristics of hash functions. But there's a major problem, of course. Uh, the blockchain is really easy to manipulate. So you just need to recalculate the whole chain. You have all the information, you can adjust things, and you say, well, let's start anew from the beginning and let's build a new chain. This is not what we want. We want to have something, and I, I'm pretty sure you have read this uh, quite a few times, that the blockchain is a database which is immutable, <laughs> which means we cannot mute it. Um, but here it's easy, easily mutable because we simply start anew change a few things and can recalculate the whole chain. So we have all the information. So what we now do is we add one security measure. So to avoid manipulation, at least in theory, we sign the last hash value and we have seen how this works. We have the hash value. We generate here a key. So I generated a new. I could have reused the one from before. Um, I use my uh, key pairs now to do the uh, encoding and I sign the last hash value. So if now I send you such a blockchain, 
with the last hash value assigned by myself, you can easily check that this is a blockchain that I have built. Again, and therefore I write here in theory, it all depends on the fact that my key is private and so forth. So social hacking as one major example is always a risk, but from a technological standpoint, we can say, well, why are this procedure? We make sure that uh, everybody can verify that I and only I have signed this last hash value and with this last hash value, the complete blockchain, simple blockchain. If we can make sure that the private key is indeed safe, then the blockchain plus the signature is almost impossible to manipulate, although all the information is publicly available. So we have everything available. I show you everything and nevertheless, even with complete information, due to the algorithms used, it should be really, really hard for you guys to um, uh, redo the blockchain, so to say. Another idea is to make it hard to construct another blockchain with the same inputs, but in different sequence, for example, I might exchange uh, Phineas for lists in the sequence. Um, and a basic idea which is used in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, um, different disguises maybe, but in uh, Bitcoin rather closely, is that we require certain hash values to have or to show certain characteristics. Here, the first thing that I require is that we only accept those hash values which have five trailing zeros. And when I execute this code, you see it takes quite a while. We need to add a certain number. So I need to calculate here 1.3 million hashes in order to come up with a solution. But for the first block here, Jill 2004, it takes me 1.86 seconds to come up with such a hash code which has five zero digits at the end of the hash value. So this makes it compute intensive to maybe rebuild a large blockchain. And if I increase the requirement to, let's say, six digits, you see then I need already 15 million tries until I find the first solution. Here with six digits, and this takes me 22 seconds. And via this measure, I can arbitrarily increase the difficulty, and this is the word used in Bitcoin, the difficulty to find an appropriate hash code. This is kind of a security measure and uh, which shows that um, it's, there needs to be a minimum input to come up with a solution to the problem of uh, finding the next block or rebuilding a complete Blockchain. In our case, it would be still simple. So we do. We would do three times twenty seconds. It would take one minute, um, but with different requirements and uh, longer blockchains, um, you get the idea. This is kind of like when you re when you uh, mistype your password and the machine says now you need to wait ten seconds. If you mistype it once again, now you need to wait twenty seconds, um, and so forth. This is actually the same measure. When we combine both we might get higher security that we say, well, we sign the blockchain, the last hash value, and we have something like targeting um, to make it harder for sheer brute force attacks to come up with another solution. So of course we can do a combination of both, which is also done in the Bitcoin space actually. Another one um, is for example, to use a, um, a random publicly known and fixed initial hash. So that we say, well, we have this initial hash code here, and you see this is generated randomly here by the OS module of Python using operating system randomness. So this shall be random, and this is not a hash code. So <laughs> this is now generating something like a hash code, but this is not a deterministic algorithm. This is now a random procedure. And when I add such an initial value, which I share with the general public. Everybody knows this one. So I can share with everybody and everybody knows that a blockchain which comes from me about our dogs has to have this as a starting hash. Then it gets even, even much harder to rebuild this whole blockchain. 
So this is another security measure actually because everybody knows the starting value and everybody else who wants to rebuild it needs to live with this starting input. <coughs> so um, another measure, <coughs> sorry, give me a second please. Thought in my throat, as they say. Um, another measure, uh, everything alone and even this combination here doesn't make it completely safe, um, but these are all measures to make a blockchain safer. Let me come to a simple cryptocurrency example based on a blockchain. Um, this example is out of a nice book that I can recommend. It's called Bitcoin and Cryptocurrency Technologies. It's uh, from my point of view. Uh, excellent when it gets to didactics, doesn't go to all the very details, but it's, uh, from my point of view, very well written. And I'm uh, uh, transforming this example to the Python quants, uh, where I say, well, that we, the Python quants, we issue a cryptocurrency, um, which we call TPQ coins. And two basic transactions are uh, possible in this um, uh, cryptocurrency space. The one is to create coins, the other one is to pay with coins. So we are the owner of the system, we are like a central bank, if you like, we are a central instance, not decentralized like Bitcoin. We as the owner, we simply create and distribute money, like a benevolent dictator, for example. Um, and uh, people who are possessing our, our coins, they can use them to pay. And many participants are in the systems and they are identified by their public key of a RSA key pair. So I won't use a huge key here. Um, I will just represent them symbolically. But in Python, you see here, I'm, I could start this whole thing with a, um, with a random starting value, but I now choose something like a passphrase. So instead of having a starting value, which is uh, randomly chosen, I can use a passphrase here, my secret passphrase, and use this as the starting hash value. And the first thing that we do is create coins, here 10 coins, and we put them or associate them to our own account, our address. And the address here is um, 0xTPQ. This is just symbolic. This is not a real address. And if you print this out, you see we have the starting hash value and the first transaction with number 0. We created coins, 10. Here is the um, um, sub number of the transaction, 0a. And here is our address. So with our own address, we have associated 10 TPQ coins. So the initial block gets hashed and the hash value gets signed by TPQ. So here in this world, we sign every hash value. We have the starting hash. We add the information about the, the creation of coins. We hash this and we sign it. So the next thing that we do now is here you see, we pay another participant in the system five TPQ coins. If uh, paying here, doesn't necessarily mean that we get something in return. We just um, transfer TPQ coins to the address of another participant. So this is a pay coins transaction with ID one in our case. So we have the starting hash. Our consumed coins are from the very first transaction with number zero A. And we pay five coins to recipient number one. And the remaining five coins, they are now attached to another address of ourselves. So when we see the second block, you see we consume the originally created coins. So we just work with what is there. We pay five to somebody else in the system and we book five on another address of ourselves. Again, we hash that and the hash value gets signed by ourselves so that we have kind of a secure, um, or almost secure blockchain. Finally, the other participant can use the coins to buy something. So here, 2.5 coins, which the receiver got in transaction 1A, 
now get transferred to a seller of some good here in transaction 2a and 2b now assigns the remaining 2.5 to another address of the recipient and so forth. So this is kind of already the basic working of a cryptocurrency. But this one is kind of centrally supported. There is a single instance which um, takes care of it. It's kind of a central ledger with a single entity um, do the accounting. Bitcoin, of course, works decentralized. But the basic techniques here used in the blockchain are similar and comparable. And everybody can recover the complete history of the TPQ coins. So if you start with the, if I go back here at the beginning with the initial hash based on our phrase, you see here that we created something, um, then we uh, distributed five coins to somebody else. This guy used 2.5 to buy something from a third party and so forth. And all these calculations are public and easily reconstructed. The problem is that, well, this guy might be um, um, uh, not a uh, proper one or that one. And uh, what one must avoid is that there is a potential to manipulate this blockchain. This is what the security is all about. But um, for the moment, if we have a look at our blockchain, you see here the first block, the second block, and the third one. And you see this basic structure that here the initial hash and then the previous hash is the starting input for the succeeding block. So we built indeed a blockchain where the single blocks are linked via the hashes from the previous blocks. This is one of the basic ideas of blockchain. Now an additional ingredient, Bitcoin addresses. Um, Here I have found, and I found this just this morning, but it's, it's really nice. Um, it's a Python 3 implementation, rather new here, uh, out of July this year, for the generation of uh, Bitcoin addresses based on elliptic, uh, elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. And uh, there is an implementation in Python here, so it's kind of uh, straightforward to work with that. And you see the complete class that is used here. The class is called key. And I recommend and encourage you to go through this. Now with your background knowledge, you should be able to um, understand what is going on here. Because in principle, this now puts together all the single elements like uh, public private key, um, uh, hashing and so forth, what we have covered before into this class to generate addresses. What is new here is a certain kind of encoding certain kind of encoding in a sense that addresses, and we will see that in Bitcoin, are represented in a certain way. But let us start with the generation of a key in a random fashion. Here, see, I instantiate an object of the class without providing a parameter. And when I look up printable PK, PK stands here for private key, I get the private key, SHA-256. And having generated the private key, by the use of ECDSA with a certain generator point, elliptic curve uh, encryption, uh, we get the public key. So the mechanism to get from uh, the private to public key is kind of really involved and um, it's much, 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 much more involved to get from the public key to the private key. That's the basic idea. And here you see also the length of the public key, which is uh, much longer than the private key. I said there is one thing that is new, and this is the base 58 encoding format. You see here now for the first time a Bitcoin address. You remember I used some symbolic stuff like 0x, uh, TPQ, and so forth. But this is kind of uh, would be a proper address with some uh, minor adjustments um, in Bitcoin. And the encoding format is that for human beings, it's uh, more easy to type them because what they do is they don't use a capital O nor zero and all these things that can be easily um, uh, mistaken when you type it in. So everybody knows that when you read something and say, well, is this capital O, is this zero, is this a capital I or one? So here you see a one and this is only one and there is no capital I in there, for example. So this is just a representation mechanism. 
base 58 encoding I provide you here with all the um, links that explain the single concept. But this would be something like an address in Bitcoin. And remember my chart with the number of unique addresses in use um, where we saw this uh, being kind of volatile, but nevertheless growing over time. Of course, what we can do, we can generate a private key based on our own passphrase. So what I'm doing here um, is the same procedure, but this time I generate my private key myself. So here, Bitcoin is really cool, is my input text, my passphrase, and my private key is the one that you see here. And I can, and this is the major point, I can pass this to the key generation. So previously we did this randomly, but now you see the printable private key is exactly what I provide here and not randomly chosen. Public, public key according to ECDSA and the address accordingly a different one. But you see again um, the type here without zeros, uh, capitalized and so forth. Um, kind of easier to uh, type for human beings to read and to type for human beings. Bitcoin transactions, a very short uh, part here. Um, using the Bitcoin client, I'm just embedding here code from the command line. Um, command line interface here, Bitcoin, and you see here, get new address, and I get such an address, <laughs> like the one I've seen before. When I have such an address here, with the variable name new address, what I can do is that I send to the address that I have defined before, 10 bitcoins. This is out of the um, test environment, regression test here. Um, and you see the transaction hash. So every transaction gets a hash. You see it here. And here you see the, um, the two transactions. You see the uh, uh, new address, mvbnr. This is uh, the one we had here. This is mvbnrcx. This is now the address which has 10 bitcoins. There are no confirmations yet, and there are 40 um, left because uh, in this uh, test environment, the account has 50 Bitcoin. So this is the basic working of the um, transactions here. So rather straightforward here, we, uh, for testing purposes only, we generate a new address. In a real world case, we would get the address of a merchant or somebody else you want to send the money to, the bitcoins to. Here, send to address here from the merchant or what I've generated, 10 bitcoins, the hash of the transactions, 263. And you see here the transaction ID and also here the same transaction ID. So these are, I started with 50, I have 40 left and here are the 10 that went to somebody else. Here in the test environment, they went to yeah, a test address, <laughs> to say a randomly generated test address. So that's the basic working. I think we now have everything together um, to go to Bitcoin mining, which is um, now straightforward with our background. I will quickly go back to my example about um, uh, Eve and the hash code using now SHA-256. And when I calculate the SHA-256 hash code of my first name, you see here the output, 9195 something. So far, so good. Bitcoin mining is about finding a certain hash code which is small enough. So here I define an artificial target not with, you remember, I used the example of trailing digits uh, of zero. Now I make the same example with leading zeros. So here my target, artificially, randomly defined, has three leading digits. And the idea is that I try to find a hash code which is smaller than the target value. And my hash code, obviously, is all but smaller because it starts with nine something. But when I now add a number, a certain number here, 23240167, in front of my name, you see that the hash code results, which has indeed, here in this case, uh, seven leading uh, zeros. And this one is small enough. And this is basically the problem of Bitcoin mining. To find a hash code for a certain input, the block, namely, 
the block with all the transactions represented by another hash code and so forth, but to find a hash code which is small enough. And small enough is defined by the difficulty. You remember my chart about the difficulty. Difficulty is increasing, which in simplified terms means adding zeros here in front. So the more zeros I require, the harder it gets to find an appropriate hash code. This is the basic idea. If I now do a brute force analysis here and um, start with zero and iterate over all the different numbers and add them to my name and uh, do the hashing and check whether it's small enough, you see, oh, well, there after a certain number of trials, I'm successful. Then I find another uh, successful um, combination and yet a third one. So here you see um, that the problem is typically has typically not a unique solution. It rather has multiple solutions, but although I find three here within one minute, there is no guarantee to find one at all that quickly. So here I do the same example with my name uh, consisting of first and last name, Eve Hilpish, and doing the same exercise. The rest of the code is the same, and you see after 1 minute 14 seconds, I haven't found a single number up to, how many are there? 55 million. So I've calculated 55 million hashes uh, here in 1 minute 14 seconds, and I didn't find a single hash code that satisfies my requirement to be small enough small enough defined by my target value. So this is the basic idea behind Bitcoin mining. Uh, in Bitcoin mining, the input is what is kind of larger. And I based this example here on a nice uh, blog post out of 2014. I've adjusted it. I've transformed it uh, to Python 3 instead of Python 2 and so forth. But it's uh, a nice read and I provide you as, as good as I can with all the links and everything that might be of interest to you here. And you see I'm using a couple of things among others struct, uh, Benaski here in Python 3 and Hashlib once again. Here you see a graphical representation of such a block. The, the block has different elements and the yellow ones are the relevant ones. We have a version number, a hash from the previous block reversed. So you see here at the end are the zeros. Then the Merkle root. The Merkle root is a hash code for all the transactions. In our block, this will be 99. A timestamp, number of bits representing difficulty, and the nouns. This is the number which solved the puzzle, so to say, which is kind of the number which uh, led to the respective um, block hash, which was then accepted. I can easily represent all the relevant uh, uh, parameters, input parameters here as Python code. So version equals two, the previous block hash code, the Merkle root, uh, the time here, which is encoded, which is 20th of February in 2014, and the respective difficulty. Number of bits here, you see this is the difficulty. This is just a number which increases over time, as we have seen here are also um, two links with regard to um, the difficulty. Uh, I would skip over that. Um, these are just elements for the calculation of the difficulty. Um, because I have an eye on the time, we are a little bit over already. Um, but I just want to illustrate how this works in Python. Bitwise operations are key here. And the relevant operation is done here, where I do uh, where I generate the hex string with the target value, the target hex string. And there I use all the elements from before. And you see the resulting hex string has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15 leading zeros here in this case. And this is what we will use. Um, the uh, C-struct representation is what we will use for the uh, comparison. But this is, for us human beings, easy to read. We need to find a hash value which is smaller in value than that particular number. I skip over that as well. This is just to illustrate how struct works. We don't need it really. Um, I know already the nouns that will solve my puzzle. And you can easily look up 
uh, the block and the information here um, on Block Explorer. I think I have opened that. Yeah, here is the block. So this is the block we are talking about, and we are looking for this hash value and this Merkle root value. So these are the two values that we're now going to recover, block 2868.19. And um, I know already the solution, the nouns, I can read it <laughs> on the side, and I will start my endeavor at uh, here 850 million in order to not have the code running too long. This is now actually the whole mining procedure. Here we encode the header information, the block in the blockchain with all the inputs, the previous block, the Merkle root, and so forth, um, difficulty nouns, and so forth. And here the checking takes place. If we find a hash code which is small enough, then we print out success and we print out the nouns and the value that we found. And you see here we start with a value 850 million. Again, this is just uh, that it doesn't take too long. Uh, here we find it at 856 million and you see the resulting hash value satisfies the requirement. This takes 30 seconds. And if I would have started at zero, uh, you can imagine how long this would have taken me. Um, too long actually with Python on my machine. Um, but this is the mining procedure and you see the code itself is straightforward. Here is a little bit of uh, trickery going on if you like with regard to uh, getting the header right, rightly represented in Python. The hashing here is a double SHA-256 hash. So we hash it one time and do another hash on the hash. But this is just hashing as we uh, have seen it before. And the rest is now checking whether the hash is um, small enough. So this is sheer brute force uh, because there is no algorithm which uh, can speed things up. So we just need to run through all the numbers that are possible. Bitcoin mining in a couple of lines of Python code. The final thing, and it's the, the last and closing thing for today's uh, webinar here is the Merkle hash. Because uh, let me quickly go back to it. Um, here in the representation, you see the Merkle root or Merkle hash. This is another hash in here, but this is, so to say, the representation of all the transactions relevant for the block. And all the transaction, this can be something. So here for the relevant block, it's actually 99 transactions. And you see here the complete list of all transactions represented by the respective hash codes. So 99 transactions are taken and are hashed in kind of a layered way um, to a single hash. And this is then called the Merkle hash or the Merkle root. The Python code is actually, uh, again, quite straightforward. A couple of lines here. This manages the pairwise hashing because from 100, you would uh, take 50 pairs and then you would get um, to uh, uh, and you were 50, then you would have uh, 25 pairs. 25 is not even, so you have uh, one left over, which you hash with itself and so forth. This is just the logic which um, says how we aggregate things and we aggregate things pairwise and need to take care whether we have an odd number left or not, or an even number. In the even case, it's even simpler. And this is just the hashing of two transaction hashes. So it's all about hashing. You see, hashing is at the very core. And uh, in the end, what I'm now not showing kind of is that obviously every transaction hash gets signed by, by the relevant party and blocks get signed and so forth, signed by many others uh, in the system. So there are confirmations taking place. This is something I cannot cover here today. But if we calculate the Merkle hash, taking as input our 99 hash values that I've shown you. you remember this um, long list object with 99 strings in there. Uh, we get here the hash value of 871714 something. And if I look this up here, it's indeed 871714 DCBAE. So here is the Merkle root. This flows into the block as an input parameter, 
and the nouns which solves the puzzle, so to say, which is the winning nouns for the mining of the block, uh, is here. So this is the 856,192,328, which uh, brought us to this particular hash value, which was small enough given the then current um, difficulty. Yeah, this was the goal of uh, my webinar today. We are a little bit over time, but we have touched upon many, many important technologies. And you see there, um, I think in, in some parts, easy to understand, but nevertheless quite involved. So we needed the time to cover everything. And um, we haven't covered all the single things in detail, like uh, how the decentralized system works, uh, what role confirmations play, and so forth. But I think now that you have um, access uh, in a Pythonic way to the most important technologies, it's much easier to get concrete when, um, when one talks about the different uh, topics. I hope uh, you have enjoyed what we have covered today. I hope that uh, I was able to uh, bring a little bit more light into the um, into the certain topics. If you are interested in what we do, again, I remind you of what I showed at the uh, beginning. Just go to tpq.io. Um, I say thank you. I hope to see you soon, uh, speak to you soon, and uh, follow me on Twitter if you're interested in the slides. I don't know, I will do a couple of updates, but uh, for sure um, I will uh, post them shortly and uh, also the video, which means the recording of today's webinar. Enjoy, happy Python coding, and uh, yeah, uh, maybe you come up with a nice blockchain idea, and if so, let me know. I'm more than interested in it. Take care, bye-bye.